Hello, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Truth. Today is part three of the gift, the gift of languages. Now, we have established that the example of the gift of languages in 1 Corinthians 12 is the account of Acts 2, where they were given the supernatural ability to speak in languages they had never spoken before. Okay? It is, so it is the same gift. Not only is it the same gift, um, Acts 2 is an, an example of the gift of languages. And having said that, Acts chapter 2, if you pay close attention to those who heard them speaking, they heard them speaking in earthly, authentic languages. The very languages the people spoke is what they were speaking. Okay, It wasn't gibberish. It wasn't ecstatic speech. So fact number one, those gathered in the upper room were in fact speaking languages they had never spoken before. That was the miraculous gift of languages or the gift of tongues, as they say. Fact number two, the people heard them speak in earthly, authentic languages, the wonderful works of God. So this miraculous event was not only seen and heard, but the speaking understood. And that is the example we have of the gift of languages, the supernatural ability to speak in many different languages. Okay. All right. We also established that modern tongues is not the authentic gift of languages. It is, in fact, a counterfeit gibberish or ecstatic speech, either by the human spirit or, in some cases, a demonic one. We also established that the gift of languages is not the Pentecostal experience Pentecostals claim to have, or they, they talk about that. Because number one, the occurrence here in Acts 2 was earthly, authentic languages. Modern tongues that are heard today are not authentic languages. The claim is that, well, it's the Holy Spirit, or it's a heavenly language, or it's an angelic language. It's just not true. Number two, the purpose was not for the believer to continue speaking in tongues, in private prayer in all ages to come, okay? But for the unbelievers to hear the gospel message that day and be saved. The Holy Spirit was for the believer and is for the believer. The Holy Spirit was given to the believer. But the miraculous phenomenon of speaking in foreign languages was so the unbelievers would see this great outpouring that was prophesied about so they would believe the gospel and believe God, believe the gospel and be saved. All right, so this phenomenon was not a sign that the believer was filled with the Holy Spirit as Pentecostals claim. The gift of languages was a miraculous phenomenon that occurred for unbelievers who were present that day that they would understand and know that this was the prophecy of Joel, which Peter reiterated. That God would pour out His Spirit upon the Jew and Gentile, both for their salvation, number one. Secondly, their empowerment and indwellment. And of course, as we have already said, this was a partial fulfillment of the judgment that would come upon those who reject Christ. All right, today we're going to look at... Uh, look more at the scriptures and explain as we go along. So we're going to do some reading and then explain. All right, so let's look at some references in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John um, that Jesus spoke about the apostles and their ministry and what goes along with Acts 2 here and that he told them what they would be doing. Let's look at Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. All right, the Bible says, Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me. Now, Jesus is speaking to his disciples here. We have the account in Acts 2 also. Um, verse 19, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Verse 20, Teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you 
uh, always, even unto the end of the age. So this is the Great Commission, okay? Everyone knows that, where from the time of Pentecost, the apostles would preach and teach the gospel and Jesus would be with them, okay? Meaning he would give them the Holy Spirit that he promised he would give them. He would baptize them and empower them and equip them to do his perfect will. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 1 and we'll see the account there. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Did you hear that? But wait for the promise of the Father. Oh, okay, so Lord, you're going to give us the promise of the Father. Yes, this is a proof text that the promise of the Father was given when the disciples were baptized with the Spirit. What is the promise of the Father? The promise of the Father was salvation for all who believe, not just Jew, but Jew and Gentile. And it was given to them at the same time um, that they were baptized. As Ezekiel 36 tells us, I will put my spirit within them. And that's what Jesus did. Look at verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So you see, at Jerusalem is where they would be given the Holy Spirit. They would be given the promise of the Father. Okay? The promise was the giving of the Holy Spirit. They would be giving the promise of the Father at Jerusalem. We need to understand that. The Holy Spirit was... Uh, threefold. He would cleanse them, empower them, and dwell inside them forever. They were baptized. They were immersed, is what it means, by the third member of the Trinity. Friends, this is a proof text that the promise of the Father was given when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's just a fact. Verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. It's not for you to know. But speaking of power, you will receive power. The Greek word is dunamis, okay, which means they would receive miraculous power to do signs, wonders, and miracles. He said, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So these miracles, signs, and wonders would be a part of their ministry, okay, in the beginning of the building of the foundation of the church. And he says, you shall be witnesses unto me, which is the Greek word mar martus, something like that. You'd be martyred. You're going to be martyred in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. A witness, a testimony, a martyr. Jesus tells them he's going to give them the supernatural ability to perform miracles, wonders, and signs, and they will be martyred for it. And of course, these things would accompany the gospel. Now notice the Bible says they will be supplied with this power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon them. Meaning... The Holy Spirit would come upon them and give them the supernatural ability to perform many miraculous works. And as I said, it would accompany their preaching. Why? For what purpose? Why do these miracle signs and wonders? So unbelievers would see and know that it's God. Uh, when Jesus preached and taught, um, Miracles accompanied him, just as we see here in the book of Acts. The preaching of the gospel, miracles accompanied that. All right, so in Pentecostalism, they believe in every age, those, everyone will be given the same power that the apostles received and that everyone would be given the supernatural ability to perform miracles, at least one of them. And as a believer, they say you just have to have faith and believe that God will do it. And if you have enough faith and, 
and you believe God will do it, God will give you the same supernatural ability He gave the apostles. And of course, this verse is used with 1 Corinthians 12, where the supernatural gifts are listed. And Pentecostalists believe that all the supernatural gifts have continued to this day. And it's a belief system called continuationism. But again, that is not the purpose of this verse or what it is saying or means. Okay, in Acts 1.8, Jesus was addressing the apostles when he said, you will receive dunamis, you will receive power, the supernatural ability to perform miracles after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He was not addressing believers of all ages when it comes to being given miraculous power. Now understand something here. All believers, uh, are they given the Holy Spirit? Yes. Are all believers baptized? Yes. Do all believers have the ability to live a holy life with the power that the Holy Spirit provides and enables us to do? Yes. But the supernatural ability to perform miracles would only be given to the apostles and Christian leaders during the time of the apostolic era only. And the power to perform miracle signs and wonders would be used in the building of the foundation of the infant church. You can see that clearly. Many deny that because they want to say that it's not in the Bible. But let me say it again. Miracle signs and wonders accompanied the preaching of the gospel in Jesus' day. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's what you see. It was the same. Okay, for the book of Acts. It was the same for the apostles. This was God's design, folks. This was God's design for that time in Europe. Now, how do we know that? Let's look at Hebrews 2, um, 1 through 4. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip or drift away. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, um, in other words, prove, if it proved to be reliable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, Jesus, and was confirmed unto us by them which heard them, which was, heard him, which was the apostles, God also bearing them witness, with what? Both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his, his own will. You see, what God designed, what he, what he desired to do. He is speaking here in verse 4 of the supernaturals. The supernaturals is what authenticated the gospel message, the gospel messenger, and the gospel ministry during the building of the church's foundation, of which God's, it was God's will at the time for the apostles and Christian leaders. The question is, how many times do you lay a foundation in building a house? Multiple times? Or just once? I think you know the answer. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22 again. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, signs, and wonders, which God did in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. You saw proof of what Jesus did as he performed these miracles. All through the book of Acts, what do you see? Signs, wonders, miracles accompanying the preaching of the gospel. Acts chapter 6 verse 8. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Um, Acts chapter 8 verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, I know we already know this, but I want to go through and just mention a few. Acts chapter 15, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience unto Barnabas and Paul, 
declaring what miracles and wonders God had worked among them. Okay? Acts 19.11. Acts 19.11. I believe this is speaking of Paul. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. All right, you see all of these verses show, and there's many more. They show how that Christ was approved among them. God was approved among them, among unbelievers, by miracles, signs, and wonders. In other words, the truth that they preached was accompanied with miracles, signs, and wonders. And everyone would say this was of God. Remember, the supernaturals validated the preaching and the preacher. It was for the unbeliever to believe all of this and be saved. That was the purpose of God using the supernaturals. Okay? Since we have the complete closed canon of Scripture, the Bible validates truth. Did you hear that? The Bible validates the message, the messenger, and the ministry. The Bible does this for us today. And the Bible is sufficient. The Bible tells us for all things that pertain to truth and godliness. All right, remember Hebrews 1.1, God at various times and in many ways spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. I think we need to understand that God worked in many different ways in many, at many different times in our Bible history. Okay? We need to understand that. Look at Mark 16, 14. Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven, that's the eleven disciples, at the, as they sat at the table, and Jesus reviled and rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believe not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now, we either believe that or we don't. Um, verse 15, there's the commission again. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And what that means is shall be judged, sentenced, or condemned. Verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. All right, he is here addressing, again, what the apostles would do and those the Holy Spirit chose to use to perform the supernaturals during that time and era. This is not a reference to everyone for all believers in the coming decades but those specifically chosen for the task given at that time. And we see in the book of Acts who was chosen. The apostles and Christian leaders were chosen to do this. All right, I believe the word them is a reference to who Jesus was talking to for the period of the Acts of the Apostles. I believe he was addressing the apostles. And of course, he would also use Christian leaders as well to perform miracles during that time for validation among unbelievers. All right, so I believe the correct rendering here in Mark verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 17 is, um, these signs shall follow you. I believe he was speaking personal. He was talking to them. Verse 17 and 18 also says what the apostles would do. They would cast out devils and also speak in languages they had never spoken before. And we see that fulfillment in the book of Acts chapter 2. Um, also in the book of Acts, they would not be affected by poisonous snakes or poison for that matter. They shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. <laughs> they will lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. And we also see them doing that over and over and over again, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Look at verse 19 and 20. So, then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat on the right hand of God. Okay? 
This is also recorded in Acts 1 9. Verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, now watch this, and confirming the word with signs following. That is vital to understand. Confirming the word of God with signs following. Jesus and the apostles would confirm the preaching of the gospel with miracles, signs, and wonders so unbelievers would believe the gospel and be saved. Now, I'm repeating myself over and over and over again because we need to hear this. Today, the preaching of the gospel is not accompanied with miracles, signs, and wonders for unbelievers to believe and be saved. Okay? The gift of languages was a sign to the unbeliever that Jesus was the true God. This miraculous event happened to convince the Jews in Acts 2 that Jesus was and is the Messiah that they crucified. And that is what Peter told them in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, where we read. If you remember back in a few lessons, this also confirms what we said about the gift of faith, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, being temporary signs that accompanied the preaching of the gospel. After the New Testament was completed, uh, Miracles, signs, and wonders by one man being chosen of God to perform them would no longer be the normative as it was in the book of Acts. Um, today, signs are not needed to accompany the gospel for souls to believe and be saved. Does that believe God can't do what He did before? No, He can if He desires to. But all of that to say this, the gift of languages was a temporary sign gift and was to be used for God's intended purpose when the church was in its infant stage, not for all generations to come, okay? We've not been told the truth. We've been lied to, okay? The Holy Spirit Himself was for all generations to come, but the miraculous manifestation that occurred was for that time, okay? For God's purposes, Look, for those of you who are in Pentecostalism, the Holy Spirit Himself is not tongues. He's the third member of the Trinity. He's God, and He is to be respected and honored and not grieved. He is God the Holy Spirit. Understand, He Himself is not a foreign language or tongues. He is God the Holy Ghost. All right? Pentecostal theology is so bad that they are taking precious children... That's what I was taught. And placing them at the altar in the front of the church and telling them they will know they have the Holy Spirit when they speak in tongues. They did the same thing to me. Stay down at the altar until you speak in tongues. These children have not been taught proper theology. Many of them don't know the truth about Jesus, let alone the truth about the Holy Spirit. But because they are vulnerable, okay, the children do what they're told. I did what I was told. And then they grow up believing that they did the right thing and that Pentecostalism is the only way. Look, if you are a Pentecostal parent and you are listening to this video, I implore you, I beg you, teach your kids sound doctrine so that they can have the knowledge of God and grow in God's grace. Encourage them to seek wisdom and to get understanding, as it says in Proverbs 2. Teach them the Bible. And if you are a young person and you are watching this video, I want to tell you, you're being lied to. You're not being told the whole truth. I beg you, hear what I am saying in this video. I was a young person growing up in Pentecostalism just like you. I thought I was being told the truth. But when I began to study the Bible by learning the meaning of Scripture, I realized that Pentecostalism was bad theology and will lead a person deeper into false teachings and deception. And the farther into the false teaching you go, the harder it is to get out of it. In Pentecostalism, it is a fact. Their view of God is inaccurate. Their view of man is inaccurate. Their view of pneumatology is inaccurate. And that's the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, that teaching primarily comes from Arminianism back in church history. I beg you, before it's too late, come out of that movement. 
come out of that movement because it's a deceptive one and the teachings, the teachings are false. I also want to say not everything is bad. I'm not saying that. There are people that I believe are truly saved. We were saved in the Pentecostal movement. Uh, people who know the Lord. I believe there are people who know the Lord. But the theology is bad. The teachings, most of them are inaccurate. And at all costs must be avoided by you as a new believer. All right, just for a moment, let's turn our attention to a question about speaking in tongues in a private prayer language that Pentecostalists believe exist and they claim that it is a real heavenly language. They also claim that it's in the Bible. The question is this, how does God want us to pray when we come before Him to make our requests known unto Him? How does God want us to pray, okay, when we come before Him? Well, we need to look at Matthew chapter 5 because this is, this is vital vital to understand because I think it goes along with what we're talking about. Now, in, in chapter 5, everyone knows this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is describing the character of true faith. Um, everyone knows that Matthew 5 to the end of Matthew 7 is the Sermon of, on the Mount. And Jesus is dealing with righteousness in this chapter. Um, he is describing in this chapter the character of true faith. And the reason he is doing this is because of what the religious leaders have done in twisting the scriptures to mean something that it doesn't mean and the Jews believing things that they shouldn't believe because of false doctrine and that he, it has changed the teachings. They've changed the teachings of the Bible. So two things the rabbis done in deceiving the people. And that was number one, they distorted the meaning of what God said in the law. And number two, they added their own thoughts to it. Okay, much the same way in what is happening in Pentecostalism from the turn of the century for years and years now. In chapter five, he speaks of righteousness and happiness, righteousness and discipleship. Righteousness and the scriptures, righteousness and morality. In chapter 6, it's still the Sermon on the Mount. He speaks of righteousness and practical religion, righteousness and earthly things. In chapter 7, Jesus speaks of righteousness and human relations and righteousness and salvation. Sounds like to me he covered everything that you need to know in the Sermon on the Mount. And what he's telling us in this whole sermon is, number one, what true righteousness is. Number two, how true righteousness comes. And number three, how true righteousness works. And we need to know that to keep from being deceived. It is vital we take heed to all that is in this sermon. But I want to look at Matthew 6, 5 on how not to pray. Okay? Jesus said in ch chapter 6, verse 5, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites are, for they love pray, praying, or they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Okay, now there are many in our world today, especially religious leaders, who for some reason want everyone to think that they are righteous and holy. I don't understand it. I don't know why. Well, we do know why, but they, they, this is a fact in Pentecostalism. It is nothing more than just the pride of man. They want everyone to know that they've never done any wrong or made any mistakes and that that they are so sanctified and so holy that the possibility of sinning they could never do. It's ironic that so many in Pentecostalism believe in Christian perfection, but they also believe you can lose your salvation. Well, which is it? Because you can't have it both ways. You can't believe in Christian perfection and also believe that you can lose your salvation. Well, for hypocrites in Jesus' day, public prayer was a way to be seen as a man of God or a holy man of God which clearly these, these rabbis were not. We must understand to only pray 
where others will notice you only demonstrates that your real intention is to please people and not God. And I've seen this over and over again in Pentecostalism. Men with such pride. Now, is this saying that we are not to pray in the public assembly? No, we are to pray in the public assembly uh, when called upon to do so. But if we as the hypocrites are doing it to be seen, then that's what makes it wrong. I've seen this practice among Pentecostal leaders. For some reason, humility seems to be a thousand miles away from these men. And it's not everybody, but it's a lot of these men. Jesus tells us plainly, look, you're going to find the essence of prayer, not in public, but in secret. In other words, you will find the essence of prayer in private communion with God alone. That's the way to do it. Now, in this lesson, we don't have time to go over the subject of prayer. I only want you to see uh, what's in verse 7 because that, this goes along with our lesson. Okay. Now, before we look at this, keep in mind, in Pentecostalism, they believe in speaking in tongues in their private prayers. I also believed it at one time, but it's not Bible. Number one, they believe that not only is it biblical... But they believe that they are at their highest form of worship when the Holy Spirit is speaking through them um, some kind of ecstatic speech to God in their private prayers. It's their, it seems like they're at their highest form of worship. So here's the question. What does Jesus say not to do when you pray? What does he say not to do when you pray? Verse 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now, repetitions here does not be, mean being repetitive in your prayers by saying the same things over and over again from day to day. How do I know that? Because the, our greatest example repeated his same prayers in the garden of Gethsemane while praying to his father. Jesus did. Repetitions in the Greek has a deeper meaning here. Okay? And I'm not good with pronunciation, but in the Greek, it's balateogeo, which means to stutter or stammer. It means repeating words and syllables that have no meaning. Okay? Heathens or pagans, when they would pray, would do this very thing, and they still do it today. Almost in all religions, pagan, pagans babble when they pray. It's the uttering of articulate sounds without recognizable words. That's what it is. It's not understandable. One ancient writer said it this way, the chief characteristics of prayers in heathen worship is gabbling, which is to speak rapidly or incoherently, to jabber. It's an unintelligible repetition without stopping of the same forma of words. Doesn't that sound like modern tongues today? The meaning here is like a baby trying to say dad or mom by saying dad, 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 or mama, mama. Ma, ma. So Jesus says, when you pray, don't go to your prayer closet and say dad, 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 dad. Don't do that. Speak to God rightly by using the language God gave you to speak as an adult and not a child. Now, if you have a speech impediment, God understands from your heart what you are saying. I am not talking about that at all. I am not making fun of anyone or saying anything I shouldn't say about individuals with a speech impediment. I'm speaking about people who can speak to God in their own language, but instead they speak in ecstatic speech or gibberish, and they call it the Holy Spirit speaking through them to God, because somehow this is what they received at the altar. Now, those of you who are in Pentecostalism, what you're doing in your private devotions by speaking in tongues and saying that you're communing with God and saying that it is the Spirit of God speaking through you are not following the biblical standard of proper prayer. Now, having said this, with this knowledge, I'd be afraid to speak in gibberish or static speech and call it the Holy Spirit or call it a private prayer language to God. When, when it isn't, it's a misunderstanding, friends. 
This jargon is neither angelic nor heavenly. It is, in fact, an ecstatic speech. The person alone is doing this. The fleshly human spirit is doing this. I did that. I've seen many go to pray for someone by laying hands on them and then a few seconds they're speaking in tongues and they speak in tongues the next five minutes and they don't say one intelligible word at all while supposedly praying for that person. They, they say they're praying for the person but none of it's intelligible. My friends, the Holy Spirit is not doing this. John MacArthur gave an example of the sounds that come from movement like the sound of an airplane that goes swoosh, or the sound of a zipper that goes zip, or a gun that goes bang. That is the example here. He is saying when you pray as a believer, don't use words that go swoosh, zip, or bang. We are to articulate words that are clearly enunciated and with clear words with intelligible meaning in sincerity and in truth when we're praying. So how interesting and important it is to come before God's presence to commune with Him on a level that is mature, serious, sincere, and not like the heathens. It's important to pray the way God said to pray, don't you think? And not to pray as the heathens do. Jesus' own words, He said, don't be like them. All right, look at the next phrase so we'll understand what this means. For they will think that they, for they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. Okay, that's in verse 7. Now the pagans believe the more they repeated the same form of words over and over again, the more their deities would hear them and answer their prayers. So that's what Jesus is saying here. Don't be like the heathen. Be clear and precise and accurate with knowledge in your prayers to God. All right, in Pentecostalism, many believe they're at their highest worship in prayer to God when they're speaking in tongues. Friends, that's what the pagans believe. Okay? Where, nowhere in Scripture does it encourage or command anyone to speak in gibberish or, uh, or speak in gibberish before God in prayer for their own edification or for God's. Nowhere. Wait a minute, Mike. Doesn't 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 2 tell us that? No, it doesn't. That's another verse that has been misconstrued to mean something it doesn't mean to form Pentecostal tongues. Okay? All right, let's look at it. And I'll show you the difference. Now, we're going to go over this later, but let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Follow after charity, which is agape. What he is saying is to pursue love. Now this comes from the previous chapter 13. Paul says, pursue what is the greatest to possess. That's charity. You must understand the Corinthians were elevating and desiring the supernaturals, what they believed was the greatest gift. And that's what they wanted. And the supernatural ability to speak in foreign language would be a great thing to do. And that's what they wanted to do. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, remember, there's a better way. And that better way is that there's something of greater value than the spirituals or supernaturals. The greatest quality or greatest characteristic of God is what ought to be sought after. And that is the love and affection that comes from God because it's His very nature. The same love He has shown to us he wants us to have for others. That's the greatest. Then he says, and desire the spirituals. Okay? The word spirituals is pneuma, pneuma to cause, which means the spirituals are supernatural. So Paul says, and desire the supernaturals. But rather, which is the Greek word <clears throat> uh, malon, which means to a greater degree than the supernaturals, I want you to desire to prophesy. Now, there's nothing wrong with desiring the supernaturals, but there is something wrong with being ignorant of them. You remember in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, told us that? Paul says here to desire the supernaturals. 
And if you remember in chapter 12, verse 1, he says not to be ignorant of the supernaturals. It's vital you're not ignorant of them. But to a greater degree, he says here, then the supernaturals, I desire that you will prophesy because that edifies. Paul is saying prophecy is the preferred gift among believers because it edifies. So if you're going to desire a gift, desire what edifies. And what the Corinthians were doing was speaking in some kind of ecstatic speech and calling it the gift of languages. And Paul tells them, your speech no one can understand, which doesn't edify. So the preferred gift was prophecy because it does edify. You see? All right, let me slow down. <clears throat> now, up to this time, there had been so many things happening in the church in Corinth that it caused a lot of confusion. If you read the whole book, and all the problems that existed in the church in Corinth, they added another one by practicing glossolalia in the church, which they practiced as unbelievers while they were in paganism. Okay, you remember we went over that. Glossolalia, if you remember, is ecstatic speech, which they spoke before their false gods, which was also called speaking in tongues. And they believed the speaking in tongues that they practiced before their false deities while they were unregenerate was the same way that they should practice the gift of languages before the true God in the church now because they had come to the Lord. And that's what had caused all the confusion. Friends, Satan, if he can counterfeit the true gift to disrupt the body of Christ and cause turmoil, he will. And that is the example that you see before you in chapter 14 in the Corinthian church. This is not a positive chapter in the sense that Paul wanted everyone using the gift of languages in the church so they could have their private prayer language speaking in tongues. In fact, as we've already stated, the gift of languages was for unbelievers to believe and be saved. It was a sign to unbelievers, not believers, Okay, this is why Paul had a problem with what they were doing. This was in the church. The chapter is to be seen as negative in the sense that he is speaking negative about the jargon they were speaking in the church that couldn't be understood. Negative in that sense. Throughout this whole letter, Paul many times was sarcastic and adamant in his discipline of them. Desiring the true gift was okay, but what they were practicing was glossolalia and not the true gift. Paul makes that clear in this chapter. Now, if we just look at some of the verses, we'll see that Paul is actually saying the same thing over and over again, saying the church can't understand what you're saying. They can't understand what's being said. He stressed to the Corinthians in an intense, forceful manner what they were doing was wrong. Because no one could understand. I mean, over and over and over again. Look at verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Well, there was no profit with gibberish. However, the true gift of languages does edify. This is why we know this was not the true gift of languages that Paul was speaking about here. Because he said, I'm not going to profit you anything if I do that. Okay? Um. Look at verse 8 and 9. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall pre prepare himself to battle? An uncertain sound. So likewise you, except you utter by the tongue word, words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall just speak into the air. Does he want you to speak in tongues like modern tongues? No, he doesn't. This is glossolalia. This is ecstatic speech that they were speaking, okay? This is not a reference to the true gift of languages at all. Look at verse 16. Else when you shall bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he doesn't understand what you're saying? Look at verse 19. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, a language that can be understood, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown language in a gibberish that can't be understood. 
Look, Paul is saying very clearly to the Corinthians that what they are speaking, what they're doing, cannot be understood. Friends, this is glossolalia, which is what the pagans spoke in prayer before their false deities when they bowed before their idols. Look at verse 2. In the King James Version, okay, for Pentecostalists, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now I'm reading it in the King James for, for those in Pentecostalism. Now if you look at, it, at this positive, it isn't positive, but if you look at this positive, this is what you would think Paul is saying. Okay? He that speaks in tongues doesn't speak unto anyone for their edification, but speaks unto God privately. For no one can understand the tongues but God. But in the Holy Spirit, he or she speaks something beyond everyone's understanding. Did you hear that? Now in Pentecostalism, that is exactly how this is understood. Verse 2 is understood to be positive for the believer. That Paul is somehow saying or speaking about the gift of languages. That he is saying you are edified by the gift of languages. And no one else is. And of course God is the only one who really understands what you're saying. So the belief is that this supposedly is a proof text for speaking in tongues in a private setting in prayer. But friends, this interpretation doesn't line up with the rest of the chapter. Hear me clearly. This interpretation does not line up with the rest of the chapter. So you can't use it. So Mike, what is this saying then? And what does it mean? All right. So what I'm going to do is the same thing I did before you um, in the book of Acts, if you remember. I'm going to use the Greek words, give you the Greek words, and then explain what the scripture is saying, what I believe it is saying. All right? Chapter 14, verse 1. All right, let's look at this again. Now, I'm only going to cover this briefly because we're going to go over this in verse-by-verse verse exposition in a few months when we, when, when we come to it. Because remember, we're going from chapter 12 all the way to the end of chapter 14 in verse-by-verse verse exposition. So we're going to cover that later. But let me just cover a few things here. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> he says, follow after charity. Pursue who God is. Pursue the nature of God. We know God is love, right? The Greek word for charity is agape. It means love. It is the very nature and character of God. Paul says, pursue that characteristic because it is the greatest. Okay? We don't have to describe it because it's described in chapter 13. So I'm not going to describe it. All right? You remember Paul said back in verse 31, there's something better and of greater value than the supernaturals. That is God's love. Don't set your desires on manifestations. Set your mind and desires and aspirations on those internal qualities. What God does to change and transform the person into Christ's likeness. Set your aspirations on that. Next, Paul says, desire the spirituals or desire the supernaturals. Next, he says, but to a greater degree, to prophesy, which means to speak forth the words of God. So Paul says, I want you to pursue the character of God. I want you to desire the supernaturals. But to a greater degree than the supernaturals, I want you to speak forth the words of God by revelation and reiteration, which is the very definition of prophecy, okay? Which edifies the church. Now, why is Paul saying this? Because edification is the subject of the whole chapter. The church must be edified. And as we see, the church was not being edified because they couldn't understand the speech. Okay? What the Corinthians were speaking was not edifying the church. 
Why? Because they were speaking glossolalia, which was the pagan speech they practiced while in paganism before their false deities. Look at the Greek words in verse 2. We're going to use the King James Version again here to show you why the translator placed the word unknown before the word tongues. All right. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. All right, let's look at it. The word speak, the word speaketh is the Greek word utter. Unknown is not in the original manuscripts. The translator placed it there so you would know this is not a language that can be understood. It's unknown. It was gibberish. That's not positive, that's negative. The word tongue is the Greek word glossa, which means here a language, one naturally unacquired. And many say, see, there, there you go. That's the true gift he's talking about. You, you just said it, Mike. And it would be if the context called for this to be true, but it doesn't. The translator placed unknown there so you would know it's not the true gift of languages. If it was by itself, it would be, but it's not. Again, this is glossolalia, a pagan speech, okay? Next, he says, speaketh not unto men. The Greek word is anthropos, meaning human beings. In other words, it doesn't speak doesn't speak to anyone, but unto God. The Greek word is theos, which means unto a God, a deity. In other words, it would have to be someone divine, someone higher than mortal man to understand what you guys are saying because the church is not comprehending your speech. So only God could be able to understand what you're saying. That is what Paul is saying here in a sarcastic way. Next, he says, for no one understandeth. The Greek word akuo, meaning no one can comprehend what's being said. The word howbeit in the Greek is de, meaning but. In the spirit, the Greek word is pneuma, which is used in scripture. Listen at this. Same Greek word is used in scripture for the human spirit, angelic spirit, evil spirit, and holy spirit. This is what so many don't understand about the Greek in Scripture. The same Greek word is used many times in Scripture for a different meaning. Well, then how do we know what spirit he's talking about? Well, this is where the context of the passage, the verse, the chapter before, the chapter after, the whole of Scripture and everything that ties together with this verse has to be taken into consideration and rightly divided before making an attempt to interpret. And that's why we've had great men of God, believers, who have done that for us through the years. Now, proper hermeneutics is to take all Scripture and allow Scripture to interpret Scripture without eisegesis, okay? Without your own interpretation. So we look up other scriptures that have this uh, same Greek word. We evaluate and we determine what spirit is being seen in the text, by the context, by the whole of scripture. Okay? Now, again, we don't have all the answers. We don't believe we do. Okay? We're not saying we do. But what we believe and teach has been examined and carefully considered with many hours of exegesis. And I also want to add this, because of our growing and learning of the scriptures daily, we believe this to be the truth according to our present understanding of the scriptures. Okay? It's a whole lot more studying to do. All right, let me give you some examples of the same Greek word for different meanings. Look at Acts 16:16. 16, 16. The same Greek word is used here that is used in 1 Corinthians. All right, 14. Acts 16, 16. And it came to pass as we went to pray, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Verse 17. The same followed Paul and us. And cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. 
uh, who show unto us the way of salvation. Verse 18, okay? She did this many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said unto the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out that same hour. Spirit here is the same Greek word pneuma that we find in 1 Corinthians 14 too. But it is obvious from the text that this is an evil spirit. So here the Greek word is used for an evil spirit. John 3, 8. You remember the wind blows where it wills and you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it comes or goes. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. All right. Same Greek word pneuma is used here. But it is obvious this is not an evil spirit. He is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Okay, from the context, we can tell that. All right, you remember Acts 7, 59? Stephen was being stoned. He calls upon the Lord, says, Lord, receive my spirit. Well, it's pneuma. But this is means the human spirit, okay? Hebrews 1.14, These are all ministering spirits sent forth unto them which shall be heirs of salvation. In that verse, the Greek word pneuma, same Greek word, but it means spirit beings or angels, okay? So when we come then to 1 Corinthians 14.2 where the scripture says, But in the spirit he speaketh mysteries, He's not speaking of an angel or an evil spirit or the Holy Spirit. This is speaking of the actual person that is doing the speaking and that no one can understand. And that is the human spirit. That's what it's talking about. Okay? The word mysteries. And we'll go back and read um, the scriptures. But the Bible says... He speaketh mysteries, mysterion, which means hidden secret. Through the idea of silence imposed by initiation into religious rites. All right, what we need to understand, what existed in Corinth. We need to understand what existed there to understand the mysteries which were being spoken about here, okay? As we said, this doesn't mean the believer speaks in a heavenly language before God in their private prayers and that the Holy Spirit is speaking something beyond comprehension that only God can understand. It sounds good and it sounds right, but I don't believe that's what it's saying because of the rest of the chapter. Mysteries here is speaking of the pagan mysteries, the religions that they were involved in while in paganism that dominated the entire countryside and dominated their lives as pagans, as unbelievers, as unregenerate. Paul says the person who is speaking in an ecstatic speech that no one can understand, that only a deity could, is by the human spirit speaking pagan mysteries, which means for the church, no one is being edified, okay? By the way, you need to understand when Paul says no one can understand, but maybe a God could, he is being sarcastic, as I said earlier. Okay, maybe a deity could understand, but the church can't understand what you're saying. And why would he say that? Because God can understand all things. Okay, the preferred gift is prophecy. Okay, look at verse 4. He that speaks in a language no one can understand is only edifying himself. This verse is not to be positive, it is negative. The purpose of the gifts is not to edify self, but to edify others. You remember, we learned that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 5. Paul says, I wish all of you had the true gift of languages. Okay? It's a phenomenal gift to have. I know that you desire it the most, but to a greater degree, I want you to speak forth the words of God. That's prophecy. Then he says, the one who speaks forth the words of God um, is greater than the one who speaks a speech that can't be understood. Unless, of course, he explains what he is saying so that the church can be edified. Do you see that? Look at verses 6 through 9. All right. Then Paul makes it clear here. If 
he himself spoke to them in a speech that couldn't be understood like they were doing, would he benefit them? The answer was no, he wouldn't. Unless it was by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by doctrine, which is teaching. Verse 9, Paul says, If you from your tongue utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is being said? For you shall just speak into the air. Friends, understand, Paul is saying the preferred gift is prophecy. Because prophecy speaks forth the words of God and, prophesy, and prophecy edifies. <clears throat> Paul says what the Corinthians were speaking was not edifying. No one knew or could understand what they were saying. It wasn't an intelligible speech. Okay? All right, as we said before, we know he wasn't speaking of the true gift of, the true gift of languages because the gift of languages was a gift given to edify. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says during that, uh, during that time, it was given to um, believers to edify. Um, its purpose was for unbelievers, which is why Paul writes in verse 22 of chapter 14 and says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them who don't believe. And he also says, Prophesying serveth not for them that don't believe, but them that believe. That's why we have those verses. All right, we will continue our verse-by-verse -verse exposition later on in chapter 14. We want to proceed from chapter 12 to 14 in order. Okay. So what I want to do in closing is to go back and read this in its meaning for your understanding. Okay. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 for your understanding. This is what Paul is saying, okay? Verses 1 through 5. Pursue the characteristic of God and desire the supernaturals. But to a greater degree than the supernaturals, desire to speak forth the words of God. Because the one that utters in a speech that can't be understood doesn't edify anyone, perhaps a deity. No one understands because in his spirit, he utters pagan mysteries. Verse 3, But he that speaks forth the words of God utters unto everyone to edification, encouragement, and comfort. Verse 4, The one who utters in a speech that can't be understood builds up himself. But the one who speaks forth the words of God builds up the church. Verse 5, Now I wish all of you had the true gift of languages, because it's a phenomenal gift for a believer to have. And I know that you desire it the most. But to a greater degree, I want you to speak forth the words of God. Because the one who speaks forth the word of God is greater than he who speaks a speech that can't be understood. Unless, of course, he explains what he is saying so that the church can be edified. All right. I believe this is what Paul is saying, okay, with all my heart. We're, we were not able to go over Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19, but in our next lesson, we will be looking at these chapters where it speaks of the gift of languages. And so, until next time, may God give us a heart to know Him and to know His Word, and that the Holy Spirit will illuminate the pages of Scripture for our understanding. God bless you.